This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Ali Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited about the guest of today's episode. He is the head of the Physical Activity Laboratory at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne. He has published over 250 peer-reviewed papers. His epidemiological research related to sedentary behavior has informed new guidelines of the UK Health Department and the American College of Sport Medicine, among others. He has been interviewed by Wall Street Journal, CNN, The New York Times, and now also by Physical Activity Research Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce our guest, Professor David Dunstan. Welcome, David. Well, thank you, Oli. I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. So how is everything in Melbourne? Well, in, in Melbourne, fortunately, we're moving out of our winter, um, and uh, that's probably not good for the uh, news for those in the, the northern hemisphere. But um, we uh, are starting to uh, warm up here, um, and it's always very busy with the uh, um, major projects that we have um, under underway here in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, it's always we in the Europe. We are always jealous about your your summers and winters. <laughs> Yeah. So, so to start off with, you have done research quite widely on different teams on sedentary behavior. What what is the thing at the moment that you get most excited about? Well, I guess um, we we've been researching this topic for um, more than ten years now, and um, I think what uh, 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 really defines our research program is that. Um, we um, attempt to align epidemiological research with experimental research and now as we move into real life interventions and to try and link all that evidence uh, together in what we call, you know, in, in a term, uh, triangulation of the, uh, the data. And I guess what excites me the most is that um, over that uh, period of time, we have started to um, gather evidence to really support the uh, um, up, uh, approach in the management and prevention of type 2 diabetes of reducing sitting time and moving more frequently throughout the day. We are highlighting how um, such uh, change could lead to improvements in um, glucose management and also um, reduction in um, some of the major complications of type 2 diabetes like um, cardiovascular disease. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned that you are trying to align the epidemiological and experimental research. Is there some mismatch that you, you are wondering where does it come from? Um, no, I guess um, what we have learned from the most recent iteration of the uh, US um, uh, physical activity guidelines, which was a really comprehensive um, uh, um, review of the evidence um, specifically, there was a subcommittee formed to look at the influence of sedentary behaviour on chronic diseases. And I think what, what's um, uh, quite pertinent is that uh, within that review, they identified that uh, there is now strong evidence linking high amounts of sitting to an increased risk of type 2 diabetes incidence. And I guess now it's our job to start to understand, well, why is there this link between sitting time and type 2 diabetes and that has led us into a, a number of laboratory based interventions here at the Baker and now um, in an exciting development we are now pushing this out to a longer term intervention in the office workplace for people with type 2 diabetes. Mm. And, and I think your lab was the first one to find the postprandial glucose and insulin responses related to sitting. Could you tell a little bit more about these, these experiments? Yeah, so um, back in, or oh, was it probably 2008, um, 
my close colleague at the University of Queensland, uh, um, Genevieve Healy, had published some initial work where we had used uh, um, uh, an epidemiological data set to look at the um, influence of not only the total amount of sitting time through you know, the use of accelerometers, but patterns of people's sitting time. And um, it, it was her work that uh, led to this uh, um, concept of um, breaks in sitting time, which uh, highlighted that those who spend long periods of time sitting versus those that break up their sitting time have a better cardiometabolic mm. health profile. And so what we wanted to do was take this into a, a controlled laboratory environment. And this is where we have set up an experimental model here in our laboratory where we use a, um, a study design, which is called a randomized crossover study design, where each individual undergoes each experimental treatment. And so what we've um, initially set out to do was set up a, uh, um, a period of time where a person came, came into the laboratory and we provided them with, um, initially it was a glucose challenge and then that has subsequently moved into mm. um, standard test meals. But what we wanted to do is compare a day of simply just sitting, and so we've started to use five hours, six hours of just sitting, and we contrasted that to, now this is bringing it back to the work of uh, Genevieve Healy's work of the breaks in sitting, contrasting a prolonged sitting day with a day with the um, same duration, mm -hmm. let's say five to six hours, but every half an hour or every 20 minutes, getting people up for a little burst of activity. And um, this has uh, either been uh, a light walk or a, a walk of moderate intensity. And in recent studies, we've been using um, simple resistance activities to really start to engage those lower um, muscles, those muscles, of uh, big muscles of the thigh, yeah. the gluteals, etc. What we have consistently observed and, um, across our studies and others are now starting to um, observe similar findings is that when you contrast the day of prolonged sitting to a day in which it is broken up with burst, little bursts of activity on a frequent basis, there is a, um, a, a, essentially a lowering of the postprandial glucose response to the test meal um, with the breaking up of the sitting time. And, and we've uh, been able to observe this in both mm -hmm. populations that uh, are overweight and obese, um, and also populations, um, and probably the most exciting and most um, exaggerated uh, um, responses that we've seen is in um, people with uh, type 2 diabetes. And the work of uh, um, Patty Dempsey has really highlighted that uh, this breaking up of sitting time um, could be highly beneficial for daily blood glucose control in those who already have type 2 diabetes. Mm. So basically, it's for the prevention and maintenance of the of the of the disease. And and basically, so you observed something like twenty percent decrease in glucose and insulin uh, in one day. What do you think the effects are in a longer scope, in a week, in a month, in a year? What do you expect to see in this kind of situations? Yeah, well, I think you've uh, highlighted where the evidence gap is and where we need to move to next, um, because the work that I just described to you um, is uh, clearly ca characterised by simply the acute response. Mm. And and I guess the, the challenge now is as we move into uh, you know periods of more than one day, into weeks and into months, are we likely to get um, more beneficial effects or are we likely to get similar results that we um, observe for the acute days? We have had one study where we uh, looked at uh, the breaking up of sitting time over a period of um, three days. And what we observed is that um, the, the changes that we observed from the, um, one day of breaking up the sitting um, were essentially maintained not further improved um, in the subsequent two days that followed. So it, uh, this gives us an, a little indication that this may be an acute response, um, but uh, this is again over just three days. 
you're coming back to your point, what, uh, what would happen if this was done over months? That's the big next uh, um, frontier for us uh, in, in the scientific world. Mm. So so it's been shown with the epidemiological studies that there's a strong link between sitting and type 2 diabetes. How much do you think this postprandial glucose and insulin responses are explaining of, of that increased risk? Well, I think um, it's it's a, one of the um, explanations for this increased risk um, because what we do know is that uh, um, postprandial um, glucose excursions is a, 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 an important predictor of future cardiovascular disease, and I think I think that's um, a daily challenge for people with type two diabetes um, is to maintain um, blood glucose levels within optimal um, uh, um, uh, levels in terms of uh, avoiding those postprandial glucose spikes. But in saying that, there are likely to be other mechanisms that uh, could possibly explain it. And one that may come, uh, be involved is the, the, um, the influence on the vascular system mm. and, and whether that, uh, um, that's a prolonged sitting, which has been well known for a long period of time, um, leads to reductions in blood flow, and what is the effects on um, the uh, the um, blood vessel functioning? We're starting to observe that um, uh, when you contrast prolonged sitting to um, uh, breaking up uh, that prolonged sitting, that uh, there's a more favourable effect on the uh, the endothelial function. So I think it's 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 likely to be a combination of factors, but of course. Uh, um, the, the, the hyperglycemia aspect is is one of uh, paramount concern for uh, those at risk and those with type 2 diabetes. Okay, let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. And, and in your experiments, I think you used two-minute breaks. Uh, what do you estimate is the, is the shortest break that makes effect and, and what is the mechanism that causes this one? A good question. And I don't know whether we know the answer yet about what's the shortest um, um, breaks within our studies. We have used um, breaks of, uh, initially we used breaks of two minutes every 20 minutes and we've mm. now moved to um, uh, breaks of three minutes every 30 minutes. So we, we, we're attempting to uh, sort of uh, um, reduce the frequency but increase the duration um, of the breaks. Um, in terms of mechanisms, um, it's, uh, um, uh, I think the basic characteristic of um, uh, prolonged sitting is the absence of um, um, muscle skeletal contractile activity. So I think that that's one very likely mechanism in that um, when you contrast that with um, uh, periods of uh, more muscular activity through these breaks, um, that's leading to um, uh, improved um, blood glucose um, um, control um, or, or, or glucose uptake from the bloodstream. And we've started to um, delve into this in, uh, you know, at the um, molecular um, biology level and, and, and shown that, um, that, that the breaks can actually um, initiate a, um, a, a glucose um, uptake effect um, which if you put it over periods of days, it starts to enhance that um, insulin-mediated uh, glucose uptake. Uh, so we're, I think we're start, we've only just scratched the surface in terms of understanding the mechanisms, but I think that this is what really starts to give it that, that biological plausibility of the link between high amounts of sitting and increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Mm. So, so basically, the, it is the contractile inactivity probably of the leg muscles. Uh, I'm just wondering if you would make a test setup that the person would still continue sitting up and then do, for example, resistant exercises with the upper body. What do you think we would see in, in the glucose and insulin responses in this case? It's a, it's a really good question. And um, uh, I, I think um, 
one would hypothesize that the the um, effects would potentially be um, um, dampened um, or, or, or of a lesser magnitude um, because of the the um, in the breaks that have been used so far, uh, those very large muscle groups, which enhance the um, potential for glucose uptake. In saying that, there's been colleagues um, uh, out of um, the UK that have uh, used um, breaks, which have involved um, upper body exercise only, arm cranking um, with the uh, ergometer, and, and, and still seen that um, the um, breaking up uh, of, of that sitting with the arm cranking did lead to some improvements in glucose, but wasn't compared head to head, uh, I don't believe. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the study design. Mm, all right, yeah. And and you said that there's probably effects in the vascular system. I understood that you have also done some studies with uh, with the sitting and blood pressure. Could you tell a little bit more about those experiments? Yeah. Um. So within all of the trials that I've described earlier, we've um also um uh, during the period in which the people are in the laboratory, we uh, have taken blood pressure on a um a regular basis um throughout that. And um, I guess what we have observed, a, a consistent finding, is that there has been a lowering of the blood pressure with the um, breaking up of sitting time. And the lowering of that blood pressure was probably most exaggerated in the study in which Paddy Dempsey undertook, which uh, looked at uh, breaking up the sitting time in people with type 2 diabetes. We saw uh, quite you know, large changes, reductions, in systolic mm -hmm. blood pressure, um, um, particularly uh, with the breaking up of that sitting time. And um, I think that it, it, it highlights that there are likely to be um, a number of uh, potential health benefits, particularly for this clinical population group. Yeah, and, and what do you think is the mechanisms for the blood pressure decrease uh, with avoidance of sitting? Yeah, that's another complex one, but I guess the, the, the obvious one there is about um, uh, improved um, blood flow. Um, and I guess it's uh, potentially that's uh, um, uh, providing uh, a, a, a scenario for um, improved efficiency of the, um, you know, the, the blood vessels in terms of maintaining um, blood pressure. But um, I guess, um, We've only just uh, started to look at this in terms of looking at uh, endothelial function. Is that improved uh, through the breaking up of sitting time? And in some of the studies, we're observing that uh, that improvement in endothelial function may be a potential mechanism for um, the improvements in blood pressure. Mm. And and have you observed a difference between standing breaks and walking? It would be intuitively that the walking would be much better for the blood flow. Yeah, I, and I think that that's um, it, it, it's quite a logical um, observation of um, um, finding, because the, um, if you think about the, the amount of muscular activity, um, it's uh, likely to be uh, quite uh, more substantial with uh, ambulation than it is for standing. But I guess mm. the act of moving from a seated position to a standing position. Um, does lead to uh, a, a, a small increase. I mean, I call it very, very small increase um, in energy expenditure and muscle contractile activity. And of course, we get um, a, a much more exaggerated um, muscle contractile activity with the, um, uh, the ambulation or walking. Mm. And, and do you do you think that it's just the the pressure on the on the buttocks that prevents the blood flow and could this be the effect or is it more about being stationary? Hi, uh, it's another good question. You're coming up with a lot of good questions. I um I really um, think that that's a blood flow um, consideration. Um, but I, I guess that this is where there's um, a, a lot of research that still needs to be undertaken to really unpick what are those um, underpinning mechanisms. Mm, yeah, yeah. And and then if we go a little bit more general, what what do you think? What kind of studies do we need to do related to sedentary behavior? Uh, this is likely to be a lot. Um, I, I think um, uh, 
maybe if I keep that contained to um, the population with um, type 2 diabetes. Um, I think what we need to now do is move into longer term um, uh, studies. So looking at this in the real world um, uh, setting, um, if you do um, uh, uh, get change in uh, sitting time and movement time, do, does that lead to improvement in um, glycemic control? For instance, does that lead to changes in HbA1c? Does it lead to changes in, in um, the risks of uh, complications of diabetes? So I think moving to, to those types of studies. The other types of studies that I think that um, we need to do, and you touched on this, is you know, what is the minimum um, break that is required? What, what is the best combination of break? Is it the simple resistance activities with some walking? Um, uh, how long it, um, can you sit before you start to see the detrimental effects? So there's a number of different uh, um, uh, uh, priorities for the future research. Mm. And and you said that we would move, we need to move more for the long term studies. They are usually quite difficult to to perform. They are challenging. So what what do you see as obstacles with the long term studies? Is it just funding and patience, or what what do we have as obstacles? Well, I I, I think the biggest obstacle is uh, um, uh, research funding for for these types of studies, particularly those longer term studies that um, uh, can. Um, look at uh, the longer term sustainability of the um, behavioural intervention. Um, I think um, what we uh, really um, have now that we didn't have 10 years ago is a better uh, understanding of how we can measure um, the, the actual behaviours. Um, so the use of accelerometers and also um, inclinometers, etc., have given us a, a good platform. We've got um, evidence from the, the the experimental studies which gives us a bit more understanding of okay well which mechanisms should we um, be uh, assessing within these types of studies so for instance you know glycemic control glucose blood pressure etc um, but uh, uh, the other big challenge that we have that as we move into real world um, unlike the laboratory situation where it's well controlled and you know exactly what people will be doing <laughs> during that mm -hmm. period. Outside that laboratory situation, you have, um, you know, um, a, a lot of aspects that could influence the uh, stimulus that uh, is provided in terms of um, behavioural change. So I mm -hmm. guess what we, one of the big deficiencies that we have um, in terms of, for instance, the wearables that exist at the moment, uh, and, and I use the um, Apple Watch, a Fitbit, etc. Um, are, are, are reasonably good for capturing stepping time, ambulation, etc. But at the low end of the physical activity spectrum, um, such wearables, particularly those on the wrist, um, really don't give us a highly accurate picture of a person's sedentary um, time, sedentary behaviour, which makes it difficult to use in self-monitoring um, aspects of um, behavioural change. Mm, yeah, and you said that there's improvements with the measurement. Which one you would recommend for each situation that you have wrist-worn devices, you have hip-worn devices, and you have tie-worn devices? What is the right context to use Use each, each one of those? Okay. Well, I, I guess it, this, this does depend on whether you want to use this device for an outcome measure. So if your outcome measure is a behavioural measure, such as sitting... Um, standing and stepping time. Um, the uh, gold standard for uh, um, sitting time is the um, Actipal inclinometer, um, which gives a more accurate picture of uh, um, uh, uh, sitting uh, and lying than does uh, wrist, uh, sorry, waist-worn and wrist-worn accelerometry. Mm -hmm. Because what you what you're missing out there is the separation of the different intensities of physical activity. Um, although it does, the ActiPower does include an accelerometer, it's uh, the ActiGraph uh, um, accelerometer and, and others that um, are, to, are able to separate that light intensity physical activity with that moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, so in the ideal world at present, if you are you wanting to uh, look at um, active and 
active behaviours and sitting behaviours, we uh, lean towards an approach where we use the combination of the active power device on the thigh and the active grass on the, on, on the waist. So you're able to capture across the sitting, stepping, standing, but also the intensity of the activity. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it's basically the whole continuum is important to measure, right? That's right. Um, and I guess in the ideal world, you would like to have all that in one. <laughs> But I guess what, where, where, there's, where there's challenges at the measurement is um, where do you um, place that uh, device? At the waist, at the hip? Um, uh, do you place it on the thigh if you want to get a better picture of uh, sitting? So we still are faced with those challenges. And unfortunately, the, the wrist-worn devices are not uh, um, uh, accurate enough for uh, the use of uh, for, as an outcome measure. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So let's hear a few words from our sponsors and get back to that right after. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Furthermore, Fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light, moderate and vigorous intensity. In addition to scientific accuracy, Fibian provides automatically produced and easy-to-understand reports for research participants. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com research. I think it comes to ease of use. People have used to wear watches on their wrist. It's kind of a natural place. But other than that, I think it's not very good from the measurement point of view. No, that's that's right. Yeah, and and what do you think? Like quite many waste worn devices, they they still say that they are measuring sedentary behavior. Usually, it's just I think lack of movement. What do you think? Is it really measurement of sedentary behavior? Well, with the accelerometry, it's uh, um, a cut points are, are used, and the the, the commonly used um, cut point is um, less than one hundred counts um, per minute, and I guess what um, the, 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 there is some contention there is that um, some of that may include standing because there's no movement um, during um, standing. So there's still that little bit of greyness that exists with the active graph. But I don't, I mean, from, uh, looking at the evidence, it's, it's not a substantial difference between what is observed with the uh, active PAL and the active graph. Um, but we n need to recognise the limitations that exist with using cut points such as, you know, 100 counts per minute. Mm -hmm. and, and have you actually measured that when you do this three minutes of activity, for example, standing in every 30 minutes, does it go below the 100 count or over the threshold? Have you tested it? It's a very good question. Um, we, we actually haven't um, explicitly um, reported that um, within our trials, but um, it's something that we can do um, because during the experimental conditions, we have had the people wear these um, devices. So it's something that uh, really prompts us to, to go back and, and have a look at that um, in, in the laboratory uh, situation. Mm, yeah, and, and if we move to like, why is it important to measure also light physical activity? Traditionally, we have talked a lot about like exercise activity for cardiorespiratory fitness. Why, why is it important, the light intensity activity? Well, I think it just closes the loop. Um, if we think about um, a person's uh, um, waking day, if you're taking sleep out of the equation here, the person's waking day, um, what the uh, objective monitoring has um, uh, really um, highlighted to us is that um, uh, a, a significant proportion of the day is spent in sitting time. The rest of the day is distributed between what this light intensity physical activity and, 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 and actually a very small proportion of the day is uh, spent in what's called moderate to vigorous physical activity. What, we, what the objective monitoring has done is allow us to get a, a more accurate picture or a more accurate assessment of the light intensity physical activities, which we really have not been uh, good at capturing with self-reported data.
And I'm not sure whether you saw um, the recent uh, publication in the BMJ from uh, Ulf Eklund and um, a number of colleagues where they've uh, essentially pulled data from accelerometry studies that have looked at um, um, mortality as uh, the outcome. And what's really interesting there is that, uh, that, that activity of any intensity, the more that no, the higher the activity, the uh, the lower the risk of uh, um, premature mortality. And of course, they also showed that um, uh, the sedentary time, once uh, you get past that nine and a half hours of sitting, that's where the risks really start to um, uh, be elevated um, when you compare the high sitters to the low sitters. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned moderate to vigorous intensity activity. What do you think now we are kind of talking it usually as one variable that it's moderate to vigorous activity, but there would we could also define it as moderate, vigorous, and also for athletes, even vigorous intensity activity over six met, it's not much if their maximum is somewhere around 15 to 20 mets. Uh, should we have more categories uh, when we define the higher intensity activities? Yeah, I think there are certain population groups like you just described there, like the athletes, um, for example, that, um, that that would be appropriate. I guess the challenge that we have um, when we look at this across a at the population level, um, I think um, what is a, a consistent observation is that um, very little vigorous physical activity is being undertaken um, in, in, in the majority of uh, um, individuals. So, what, yes, we're going to have some individuals, the segments of the population that are, you know, as you described, doing that more highly intense activity. But what we uh, observe from the, um, uh, the population data is that there's not a lot of people that are making, uh, you know, uh, achieving that. It's a small segment of the population. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. And and then we we talk a lot about uh, adverse effects of sitting. Uh, how bad is it to sit, stand too much? If you if you have a a profession where you really need to stand, what are the effects of that? Well, I think um, uh, there's there's some evidence out there that um, excessive standing and um, uh, is linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now. This is the, the types of occupations where standing occupies the majority of the day. Now, um, there's less and less of those occupations um, than existed you know, many decades ago, but we still have to be mindful that there, there are um, uh, uh, work uh, occupations that do require such um, periods of standing. And I guess the danger there is particularly that prolonged static standing. That um, that can be undertaken. For instance, on um, the uh, industry workers working on conveyor belts, etc. And that's why I think there's this important message of frequent postural change is essential here. It's not just all sitting, not just all standing, but frequent postural change throughout the day is really what talks to um, the ergonomics literature to the physiotherapy literature and now to the metabolic health literature. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And and now people are using a lot sit to stand desks and it's good to break up the sitting. What is your guideline? How long you should stand on each, each period of standing? Yeah, and I, um, I, this is where we uh, really uh, ride off the back of um, some of the, the um, occupational sort of recommendations, which have really come from basically computer screen use, etc., where it's, it's encouraged that um, workers should take a break at least every half an hour from the computer screen. So I, I think what uh, if we can uh, leverage off those sort of recommendations of every half an hour, I think um, a changing posture from um, from sitting to standing every half an hour would be. Um, a, a useful rule of thumb in terms of uh, a broad recommendation. Um, so I think changing posture every half an hour um, would be a, a, a good way, a good start. Let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors. <laughs> 
The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. And, and how do you see the difference between laying down and, and sitting? Uh, what are the effects to, to blood pressure, to, to these uh, glucose and insulin responses? What do you think will be the effect? Well, I guess um, they're both described as um, very low energy expenditure. Um, and both of those um, uh, postures are, you know, the absence of musculoskeletal um, contractions. Um, uh, I, I guess I, I, I'm unaware of studies that have compared them head to head. Um, but I think what I think that there would be relative consistency um, between the, the sitting and the lying um, uh, with, with respect to, for instance, the metabolic um, aspects and, and blood pressure aspects. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking like that from the musculoskeletal point of view, I think laying down or being in a, I think sitting with the hip angle and the knee angle, it might not be optimal <laughs> sedentary uh, posture that maybe laying down could, could uh, put less pressure on your on your buttocks. Uh, maybe the hip and knee angles could be better. Should there be some way in the office to be when you need the rest to be other than in a sitting position? That's a good question. And I think uh, that's probably where the, the, the science needs to inform such um, recommendations. And I think you highlight there um, potential work that could be undertaken to, to really tease out that um, particular um, uh, question. Mm. And, and then about standing up versus standing do you think the effects of breaking activity by standing could be actually affected that it's the the squat getting up and then lowering yourself to the squat that would be more important than the actual standing i uh, lean towards uh, that in terms of um the the, the act of um uh, standing engages those big muscle groups um and I guess if you think about um, from a phys- physical function perspective, the ability to rise from a chair and, and, and to uh, sit to, um, to, uh, on a chair is uh, an important um, con- uh, contributor to good physical function. So I, I guess um, what we need to do is um, have studies that are starting to look at uh, the simple act of sit to stand um, as opposed to standing or as opposed to active behaviour so that we can really uh, tease out that uh, that uh, particular question mm. yeah anyway it's it's quite uh, especially if your maximum strength is lower standing up from the seating position especially if you're not using your arms it's actually quite a quite a hard squat for many people so it could be quite a good activation of, of leg muscles and that's right and, and and i think um what we really have to be mindful of that there are likely to be aspects or segments of the uh, population whom could derive enormous benefits from that sit to stand transition and if i think about um the um older individuals um that are particularly spending long periods of time sitting those at that act of moving from a sitting to a standing position um could yield uh, enormous benefits and oh, and and, oh, and we, if you think about it um if if that done on a regular basis, it could provide that important stepping stone towards more active behaviours throughout the day. Mm. And and actually from kind of guideline perspective, it could be easier for people just to do the transition from sitting to standing rather than standing many minutes, like it might be faster to do, just kind of getting up, getting down. So it could be better for interventions. Potentially, yes, and I think that that's where um, uh, the science needs to um, be uh, undertaken to inform those potential um, guidelines relating to the sit-to-stand transition. Mm. And and if we move a little bit more more to the intervention side, uh, what groups of people should we especially aim with sit-less interventions? Well, I think um, 
where our group is moving to is understanding uh, that uh, uh, w w within the laboratory trials that we've undertaken, uh, the, 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 the most uh, exaggerated benefits that we've seen is in people who already have um, what's called dysmetabolism or um, uh, abnormal blood glucose levels, those at risk of diabetes and those with diabetes. So I think that that's one potential clinical population group um, whom could derive enormous benefits from uh, these uh, types of interventions um, undertaken on a daily basis. Mm. So, so basically, listening you, you always come back to the type two diabetes. Do you think that's the main thing with sitting, or how are the effects to cardiovascular disease? Well, I guess um, in terms of thinking about uh, type 2 diabetes, we know that um, one of the major complications of type 2 diabetes is cardiovascular disease. So I guess mm. that um, uh, but by, by uh, an approach in, in those with type 2 diabetes, um, you, you are going to be able to study the effects on the cardiovascular system. But I think your question is more about um, what about um, those who, who already have existing cardiovascular disease. I guess that that's, that's where the research in the upcoming years really needs to um, move towards to, to look at those clinical populations who could derive um, a, a great benefit from um, these types of interventions. Mm. Yeah, and and in your studies you have used like uh workplace intervention and you have tried to affect the organizational environmental and individual levels what what are the main points you have learned learned from these studies um i guess um the workplace intervention trials that we've um undertaken here um we we deliberately um uh utilized a a, a framework that was multi components meaning that um we simply didn't throw all our um, efforts into, um, for instance, changing individuals' um, behaviour. What we wanted to do in the workplace, be um, because there are likely to be multiple influences on a person's um, behaviour, um, for instance, their physical environment in which uh, they work. So um, a way to overcome that is uh, you know, provide uh, those height adjustable workstations that can facilitate um, uh, you know, a, a working postures in a seated and a, sit, a sitting position. But of course, um, if that's not supported at the organisational um, level, um, you, you really are uh, not going to get a um, great success. So that's within our studies, we've uh, uh, really worked closely with the organisations to provide a supportive um, environment to um, making such changes and, and, and to really change the, 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 the culture in, ter in, in terms of um, uh, sitting at work and, and, and looking at ways in which uh, uh, workers could still be highly productive but also um, be um, changing their uh, posture throughout the day on a frequent basis. Mm. And I think uh, being productive, there's, there's probably two sides of it, being creative and getting new ideas and then actually getting the writing tasks done and and have have you actually measured some kind of productivity in your your studies? Yep. Um, so within the um, recent trial that we uh, undertook here in um, um, uh, Victoria in Melbourne, uh, we we were able to look at um, the the changes in um, productivity in those that uh, um, received the intervention, and um, we did see some favourable changes in in productivity. Now the challenge there is it's often a difficult one to measure and, mm -hmm. and that's where I think that we need to um, really start to look at ways in which we can measure this more effectively um, and, and with greater application to you know, workplace environments. Yeah, yeah. And what, what kind of measures you used for the productivity? Um, it's a good question. Um, now, um, they're, they're the common ones, and um, I, I haven't got it off the top of my um, head yeah, here, no. but um, they're very common, health productivity um, type measures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually read one paper that was suggesting that maybe for productivity, the easiest thing for knowledge workers is actually just to use 
subjective, which is a little bit surprising, just asking, did you feel that you are more productive now or kind of just rating the productivity? Uh, what do you think? Could it, could it be a good measure? Uh, just asking people. Um, well, we essentially did a little bit of this through our um, uh, interviews with participants um, uh, uh, post intervention, um, and also, you know, starting to you know, do focus groups to understand well what, what did people like, what people didn't like, etc. And 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 that's probably not addressing that productivity aspect, but um, I think an important part of undertaking such research is that. There needs to be consideration for, you know, getting down to the individual level and understanding well what worked for them, what didn't work um, um, for, for these individuals. And it's it's been really interesting discussions and nice nice ideas. So thank you thank you for joining the joining the show. Well, thank you for having me, um, Ollie. It's really um, interesting to to be talking about the um, progress that's been made in in this particular field. And um, I think it also highlights what we still need to um, to do to better understand, for instance, the mechanisms and, and, and the ways in which we can intervene on a, um, a larger scale. This podcast is sponsored by Fibia. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher podcast.